on this computer. Here we go. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to our backyard food forest workshop. Um, here is uh, hosted by the Vanier Collective College Gardens. And um, I will just uh, start with a brief introduction and some acknowledgements. Move on to what is permaculture? What are the principles of permaculture? What is a food forest? Designing a backyard food forest. This is going to be broken down into existing site conditions, preparing the soil, different designs and shapes, suitable Quebec plants. Then we're going to finish off by having a look at our food forest and where it's at, as well as further resources and questions. So um, let me start with my um, little introduction. My name is Mark. I am the lead gardener at uh, the gardens at Vanier College. I have been there um, in this position for three years now, and I first started working with Vanier Gardens as a kind of animator here and there, I think almost six years ago now. And I have seen it change and flourish and uh, more than double in size since I've been working there. So that's a, a very exciting thing. We definitely have a lot of momentum um, moving forward. So um, that's a little bit about me. And if any of you watching at a later date, um, are feeling intimidated by gardening, feel like you're a complete beginner, um, have no fear because I myself, uh, when I moved to Montreal six, seven years ago, I knew nothing about plants. I didn't have a balcony, had no garden. My very first job was a video games tester in an office 24, which I was about to say 24 seven, but it's a little extreme, nine to five. Um, and I slowly but surely um, kind of rediscovered this passion of mine and started working as a gardener four or five years ago for private residences in the South Shore. And here I am today teaching you folk about how it all goes down. Um, acknowledgements. So there's kind of three acknowledgements I like to do with all of my workshops. The first one is the land. We are on the territory of the Ganyakahagan people and other nations of First Island. Montreal was a traditional meeting place, uh, both the, the land and the waters. So I like to take a moment to think about that, acknowledge it and move forward in a spirit of um, reparations and kind of uh, giving space for, for everyone and their cultures to exist together. So not only is it the land, but it's the knowledge itself and particularly with permaculture. We will be getting into this uh, a little bit later, but um, some of the knowledge I'm gonna be sharing with you today is coming from a Canadian background. Some of it's coming from a European background and some of it's coming from a First Nation background. So we're, we're really getting a whole mixture and blend of uh, knowledge this afternoon. And just keeping that in mind is something I like to do. And then the last acknowledgement is a little bit of gratitude towards the plants. Without them, we wouldn't have the, the food we eat, the air we breathe, the clothes we wear and so many other beautiful things in life. So um, a little bit of, thoughtfulness and, and thankfulness towards them uh, kind of set, sets the right tone for workshops, I find. Okay, now let's move on, shall we? What is permaculture? So permaculture can be essentially broken down into three things. It is an ecological design system. So we are learning how to design different systems with a more ecological approach. It is a lifestyle philosophy and it is a box of tools and tricks and tips and other such um, things that you can use to kind of uh, make your lifestyle more sustainable. Permaculture itself started in the 1970s with a fellow called Bill Mollison, who was an Australian. And he was studying with Aboriginal um, farmers. And I think he started off life as a biologist. And basically he learned uh, through observing them that there are ways to exist in life that mimic nature. And so permaculture, although it's been around since the 70s, it is really ancient and traditional knowledge that uh, we are learning and sharing here that's kind of been given a new spin. One of the criticisms of permaculture is that it's um, somewhat whitewashed, especially considering the roots and the origins of the knowledge itself. So I want to just kind of uh, make sure that we all understand that this is really um, uh, kind of ancestral knowledge that we're learning through a new edition, shall we say, that the new lease of life that permaculture has given it. So with these three things, that kind of sums up what permaculture is in a nutshell. 
Now, there are 12 guiding principles to permaculture. And when we're looking at designing a food forest, which is one of the fundamental um, designs of permaculture, we want to keep these 12 principles in mind when we take a design approach. So I'm just going to list them here for you. So number one is observe and interact. The very first thing I do when I come to the gardens each week is I stand around and I walk around and I observe. And this is really, really an important skill, especially for folks who are new. The gardens and nature in general have so much to teach you if you're just aware. And so walking around silently, kind of observing, the interaction part will be like uh, looking under rocks or just bending down and looking into flowers, kind of uh, digging in the earth, perhaps looking for seeds that are germinating. It's really kind of gentle, slow ob observations and interactions is really a key uh, principle to begin with. Next thing here is to catch and store energy. So plants are pretty wonderful at this. They're catching sunlight and storing it in forms of fruits and vegetables and starches and roots all the time. And this could also be used for things like water. Think of all the rainfall that happens. If you're able to catch that and store it, you can then store that energy for later. And there's so many other examples where we can catch and store energy. Um, one thing that comes to mind is the idea that there was a, a French permaculture farm and he ended up um, wanting to grow uh, geese, to like raise geese. And then he, he discovered that he didn't actually need to do it himself because if he provided um, enough uh, fruit, uh, trees and bushes, the migra migratory birds would come and land on his land and then he would be able to hunt them that came there. So like here, this, that was his way of catching the, the already existing bird population and sustainably hunting them, I assume and allowing them to move on once they've uh, done their business and eaten their food. So this is one way we can use that principle. Obtaining a yield. So this is kind of important, you know, like it's, it's all very well trying to live more in harmony with nature, but if you've got an empty belly, that's, that's quite difficult. So getting something from your gardens is also kind of a key principle. Apply self-regulation and accept feedback. So this is the idea that, um, that we get many forms of feedback. It could be that certain, like, certain plants don't do well. Certain things may grow and then die. And rather than, rather than beating ourselves up about it, we just kind of learn and accept that this, is, this has happened. This is nature's feedback here. And how can I then do things differently next time? And every year I have plants that, that uh, blossom and boom and are bountiful. And then I have others that dry up and die and wither or don't grow well. And I am learning all the time. And so this is really what this principle has as its core. Use and value renewable resources and services. So this really, we think about um, closing the loops in permaculture, which is the idea that everything that kind of comes into our, let's say, to talk about a garden, permaculture could be used for designing an office building or designing your lifestyle or any other kind of, um, there's so many different kinds of social permaculture and I'm gonna focus on gardening today. So let's think of this one, for example, one of the ones that comes to mind is the idea of compost. So every year, um, your traditional suburban gardener rakes their leaves, puts them in, those brown paper bags that are collected by a municipal waste system that are then driven to a composting site somewhere. And then the following spring, the same homeowner drives to uh, a nearby gardening store, buys compost and brings it into their gardens. So this is not a closed loop. We are having inputs and outputs which are leaving the garden. So by raking those leaves, composting them ourselves, and using that compost on our gardens, we're able to close the loop and use these resources and services that are available to us. So this is one example of that. Produce no waste. So waste is not waste until you waste it. The idea that in a garden especially, we can grow and use certain resources that are 100% biodegradable, that can return to the earth, that can 
be uh, reused or can be recycled and hopefully will break down and leave no traces. Now in today's society with widespread use of plastics, this is quite difficult, but this is also with a bit of time, um, this, can, this can be achieved slowly. It's not, a, it's not a very easy thing I can tell you to try and garden without plastics, but some examples, instead of buying your compost by the bag, you order it in bulk. Or instead of getting your wood chips by the bag, you speak to a local arborist and you get them delivered for free. Uh, this is another example of how uh, we can reduce waste. Next, we have design from patterns to details. So this is an idea that before we go rushing into talking about, okay, so uh, what kind of plant could I put in this part of my garden where I only have this much shade? That's, that's the details. What we want to do is take a step back and look at the patterns, especially patterns that exist in nature already, and kind of use those patterns to help us then figure out the details later on. So it's really kind of taking a wider systems approach before getting into the intricate details. Integrate rather than segregate. So this is um, an idea that uh, let's think about a very easy example is the, um, the idea of monoculture versus what's known as polyculture. So monoculture, we don't have to go far outside of Montreal to see uh, fields of single species of corn or soy or wheat that are grown in rows and controlled with pesticides and chemical fertilizers. Now, a polyculture approach would be to, you can still grow rows of corn, but you would then also allow other plants to grow in amongst that corn that might be able to um, bring in particular predatory insects that then can eat those pests that corn's threatened by so we don't have to spray them. So really integrating plants to grow together as they are found in nature, like nature doesn't have monocultures, there's always a polyculture. Even if there's kind of only one species of tree growing above you, let's think of like a, a typical forest in Canada where there's a lot of maple. If you have a look at the, the shrub story and the understory, there's gonna be many different species of mushrooms and berries and other such uh, things growing in the understory of the forest that are kind of completing that um, ecosystem and that polyculture. Number nine, use slow and small solutions or small and slow solutions. This is kind of a personal mentor of mine. Uh, you may be thinking when you want to start a garden that it's like so exciting. You just want to rush out, buy everything all at once, and then kind of have a frantic two weeks where you're in a planting frenzy. This is not what permaculture is about. And you'll see in my design later on that this is actually a design that's going to go on over several years. Slow and small solutions allows us to take our time to breathe and to observe and interact, coming back to number one there, and also to work slowly, especially if we're um, looking at transforming an ecosystem from one thing to another, like working too fast can maybe create a shock and all of a sudden, like you have some, some butterflies like the monarch behind me that used to come every year. And then because you've been out there busy gardening and everything's turned up and dug up, there's no flowers for them to feed on this year and then they won't come again next year. So this is the idea of working slow and small. Use and value diversity. So this is a, a beautiful thing here, coming back to the polyculture idea that the more plants we have and the more varieties of plants, I should say more specifically, the more varieties of plants and the more biodiversity we have, the less at risk our gardens and our ecosystem in general becomes. We take, for example, um, there's a drought one year. And let's say I'm growing three kinds of vegetables, there's corn, soy, and wheat, and a drought comes along and all of a sudden my corn fails, it's a third of my crops I've lost. Whereas if I'm growing, let's say 10 or 20 different species, and again, like, um, let's say a drought comes along, because of the different species that are there, maybe the corn will dry up, but then the other, the other plants will be good. And, and in that case, I am kind of, you're mitigating your risk by using more diet more biodiversity. And uh, this is something that uh, is really becoming um, at risk as well. Like the average, the average human being living on Earth over like, I think at the beginning of the 20th century, ate over 200 different vegetables in a year. 
like different varieties or species of vegetables. And today, I think we're down to like 15 to 20. And so like that can really demonstrate the kind of the, um, the, the culling of our biodiversity, not only in our wild ecosystems, but also in our cultivated ones as we're losing different heirloom species and such that we can bring back to life and to recognition by using these permaculture principles. Use edges and value the marginal. So this is an idea that you take a walk through a forest and if you think about this, um, where you're going to find the most biodiversity in a forest is not in the center of the forest where you're surrounded by big, huge, mature trees. It's more at the edges of the forest where there, is, where there are transitions in ecosystems, there's more uh, biodiversity generally because there's a change in systems that allows other plants to fill that niche. If you think about the middle of a forest canopy that's surrounded by shade, there's not that much sunlight. But if you get to the edge, or let's say there's a footpath going through there, all of a sudden there's a break in the trees, sunlight's allowed to come in, and now you have raspberries that are flowering and strawberries that are flowering and other plants that are in there. And this is really how edges in permaculture are used to help promote biodiversity. And creatively use and respond to change. So this is an idea um, that we have a whole different um, set of shocks that come into our ecosystem. Um, some examples might be the, uh, the loss of some of our native tree species. The American chestnut in, I think it was the 40s or the 50s, was wiped off of North America almost. At the mo then after that, it was the elm trees. And now we're living through um, kind of a dying of the ash species. Like outside uh, my window here, there's a big, beautiful dead ash tree that's being killed off by the most recent insect. And so when we're uh, responding to change, it's so how do, we, how do we now go ahead and work with this kind of globalized um, ecosystem that we're experiencing and use the fact that the ashes are dying off. Like, so what can we plant next? Or what other species could we bring in to replace it? Like, rather than um, trying to keep on doing the same thing, which isn't going to work. And like, you can try and treat ash trees, but you know, like the, 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 the system has changed. The, uh, the, the, the landscape has changed. So you can't go backwards, unfortunately. So rather than trying to hold on to our um, existing ash trees, Let's look at what other species we can introduce or what other maybe predators we could introduce to help uh, fight off the bugs that are harming the ash trees. Okay, so these are the 12 principles that are kind of um, the underlying pinnings of how we want to do the design for our backyard food forest. Now, let's see, what is a food forest? It is a traditional method of growing food. Food forests still exist today. Uh, they are known as milpas in central uh, kind of uh, Mesoamerica. They have been um, growing food over there in these milpas for, I could say, hundreds of thousands of years. There's an idea that a lot of North America before colonialists came was a cultivated food forest. They mention how, um, I, I remember reading, I forget, the, forget which book I read it from, how the white oak was found along riverbanks where First Nation people would often travel and trade. And the white oaks are quite important as a food source because they create acorns, which are very low in tannins, which basically means that the acorns are, I've, I've heard people say that you can pick up an acorn from a white oak and eat it raw, which I, uh, I doubt a little, but I think with a little, a little bit of preparation, the white oak can be made very edible. And it's the idea that you know, when the colonists came, they kind of thought, oh, wow, this, this natural ecosystem has so much abundance. There's all of these uh, fruit nut trees around when actually it was the First Nation people that had been cultivating them as a food forest style system for the last 100,000 years or so that created that uh, bounty by working with nature. Um, they have a lifespan of 80 to 120 years. Um, in Central America, you can still see where uh, communities grow using milpas. And the idea is that they, they work with a section of the forest. And it's kind of like, a, imagine it as, the, um, as like a clock face. And they'll take a section that's like from midnight to like 
2 a.m., let's say, and so from 12 to 2, and they'll work with that section and they'll reset it. So the idea being that the way that we reset the forest is generally flooding or fire, and the, the ecosystem is brought back to kind of the very beginning. It's, it becomes bare earth once, once the trees have died off or they've burnt down, you're left with kind of open field. And then these people would seed around 200 species at the same time and let them grow. And the idea being in the first five years or so, you get your very fast growing annual crops, like your, your corn, your squash, your beans. After five years, your berries come up. After 15 years, your fruit trees start producing. And after 25 to 50 years, your nut trees start producing. And then once you get to 120 years, the forest has kind of reset itself. And there's no sign of the fact that it was even reset to begin with. And basically, uh, with the milpers, they would kind of work around the clock. Uh, so one decade, they go from 12 to 2. The next decade, they go from 2 to 4. The decade after that, they go from 4 to 6. And they kind of re restart in a clockwise pattern these um, growing techniques so that by the time they've done the full 12 hours, they're back to where they started and they can start the whole system over again. And that would take you know, 80 to 120 years. Which if, you, if, you ask your, if someone asks you tomorrow, you know, oh, you know, what's the lifespan of your garden? If you turned around and told them 80 to 120 years, they I think they would be um, quite impressed. That's for certain. And they can still be found today in certain parts of the world. Not only in Mesoamerica, I know that there's um, a documentary out there about the Moroccan food forest that's been around for 200,000 years. And there's still a handful of places around the world that are growing food in this traditional techniques that haven't yet had the meteor spotlight put on them either. So food forests, basically a food forest is a multi-layered uh, ecosystem of edible and medicinal or otherwise kind of plants that are performing an ecological role that work together to create a yield for us and for nature. Now, breaking down the nine layers that we have here, we start at the very top. This is your over canopy or your canopy layer here. This is, these are the plants that get the most sun by growing the tallest. These are your big high, high level trees here. Underneath, we have the under canopy or the sub canopy. And these are plants that can tolerate a certain amount of shade and grow under the over canopy here. Coming to number three, we have shrubs and bushes, which can grow still as tall as me. Like there's kind of quite a lot of debate, you know, what makes a shrub and what makes a tree, but I'm not gonna get into that too much. Uh, we'll just say that it's a multi-stemmed woody uh, plant structure that can grow six to eight feet high. Next, we have number four over here. This is our herbaceous layer. So these are herbs that can kind of grow knee high and lower, and they generally have a non-woody structure. Number five, we have our ground cover. So these are plants that like to spread across the ground. Number six, we can see here, we have our root or rhizome layer. So these are plants that produce edible tubers and roots for us to eat. Number seven, we have vining species that like to grow up things. Over here, we have uh, aquatic or marshland species. And then number nine, we have our mycelial or our mushroom communities. And each one of these we are going to, apart from number eight, I'm not planning on putting a pond in your backyard, but each one of these, we're going to learn what kind of plants in Quebec we can put in each one of these layers. And here's the nine layers for you just to have another uh, look. And this slideshow will be available uh, along with the, the video, the recorded video, so that you don't have to frantically make notes right now. Okay, so moving on to our backyard design. Uh, we've learned what a food forest is. We've learned the principles of permaculture. Now we are going to have a look at our backyard. And these are just coming, this is a hypothetical backyard. And these are some of the assumptions that I've made, that we have a backyard that is south facing. That means that it gets almost full sun, which is what, eight to 12 hours of sun a day. There's a building on the north side. This will be your house. It's situated in Montreal. And we have no pets because I'm not planting gardens here where um, there might, like there's a lot of low growing food here. If you do have pets, you'll need to use raised beds or kind of 
figure out a section where your pets can be uh, kept out of the garden. And we are growing in a three meter by three meter space of old traditional lawn grass. So here is our hypothetical backyard. We're going to call the, um, uh, the, the house owner, we'll call him Mr. Vanier. Why not, George? And here we can see that it's just a backyard. There's maybe two or three species in your lawn grass, daffodils, maybe some clover, and of course your, your lawn grass or your crab grass. And then we have fences going on around here where our neighbors live. So these are kind of the underlying assumptions of the backyard here. Now, site conditions. When we're looking at garden design, we want to look at the existing conditions. So this includes, where is the sun coming from? What is the soil like? Where is the wind coming from? How much water do we have? And what is the temperature or the climate like? So I'm gonna go through each one of these individually now. So number one, sun. So you'll often see that things are kind of broken down into three categories, full, partial, sun, and shade. And you can figure out what your garden has quite easily. Um, and you want to plant species according to the sun levels. And you can use observation or apps uh, and I will show you just this picture right here. So this is from my snowy balcony today. And this is an app called Sun Physician. It's uh, available on Android or an Apple. And we can see here that on April 21st, that around 9.30 a.m. to about um, 12, there's another building here, which we can't see, to about 12 midday, um, I have sunshine. And so this means that I have two and a half hours of sun. So I'm kind of in between that partial sun to shade. So this means that could I grow tomatoes on my balcony? Maybe, but I wouldn't get much fruit because they like a lot of sunshine and I don't have a lot. The good thing about this app is, or many of them, is you can stand in the middle of winter and you can change the date on the, uh, the calculator there. So you can see the projection of the sun in the middle of summer, in the middle of a winter, and you can kind of figure out which trees may block your sun, which buildings block your sun, and where are the sunniest spots in your garden. And another little tip is to kind of try and hold your, your phone camera as close to the ground as possible, because standing up six feet tall is going to give you kind of different sun levels as to if you were down on ground level. So try and crouch down and hold your phone and figure out where are the sunniest spots in your garden. And this will really help when it comes to planting your species correctly. Next thing that we have here is your soil. So I highly recommend that uh, you get digging to find out what kind of soil you have and how deep it is. So a lot of Montreal back, gar back gardens have um, a lot of backfill, maybe old construction material that's in there. Um, and I've seen a lot of assumptions that people just assume that their soil is like this and, and that's it. However, I really recommend that you get yourself a shovel and you go digging at least to a depth of four feet to try and figure out how deep the layers of your soil are. Do you have a lot of topsoil? Because it goes topsoil, subsoil, and then kind of deep soil. And it's really the topsoil, which is where the most organic matter in life is happening subsoil where there's still a lot of minerals and then deep soil where only really your tree and uh, shrub roots get. So by digging, we learn what soil we're working with. Now, there's three kinds of soil, sandy, loam, and clay. And this picture here uh, is a visual representation of a test that you can do. Take the kind of the top layer of your soil, roll it into a ball and bounce it on the top of your hand. If it is a sandy soil, the, the, the ball will kind of fall apart within one or two bounces. Like sandy soil is very difficult at holding structure. If it's loamy soil, it'll bounce for like four or five times and then uh, it'll start to crumble a little bit. And if it's clay, and I can tell you now that this picture here is a clay one, um, you can literally bounce it in your hand more than a dozen times and it may not even fall apart if it's very heavy clay. And this is all to, um, help you understand that there are certain plants that love sandy soil. Sandy soil drains very quickly. It doesn't hold moisture very long. Clay soil is the opposite. It basically holds water. And because the particles of clay are so fine, water isn't able to percolate through and you're gonna end up with a lot of flooding 
in your land. And there are certain species that will um, die very quickly if their roots are left in water. Loam is kind of the, the beautiful uh, limbo in between. It's about 40% clay, 40% sand, and 20% uh, what we call um, humus, which is the decaying organic matter. Now, all this goes to say that all soil benefits from organic material. And I'm going to talk about how we can add organic material to our soil soon enough. Now, winds. This is important because particular winds, especially in Canadian winters, can kill trees and plants because especially if we have um, freezing winds or like freezing rain, uh, they can come in generally from the northwest and they can really um, harm your trees and cause a lot of damage. So we want to look at windbreaks here and the best windbreaks that we can grow in Canada are conifer trees. Um, if we're going to put up a fence, we don't want to make it a solid fence. Number one, this will act like a sail and kind of blow away. And then number two, it actually, because it's a solid break, I've seen uh, images where they kind of um, test the aerodynamics and there's a, there's a curve that happens after the fence that actually speeds up the speed of the wind uh, because it's kind of, kind of being funneled by the, uh, the solid fence here. So we want to use uh, fences that partially like we have here, we have a nice picket fence so that partially slows down the wind. Now, I'm not saying that you ask your neighbor to print conifer tree, uh, plant conifer trees, uh, but this is just an example of what we would look like if we were to plant a windbreak. And the best windbreak is this kind of triangular uh, shape here as well that allows the wind to kind of flow up it and flow down it and slow down on its way up and its way down. Um, generally, we don't have a problem with wind being in the city because we have a lot of buildings that uh, act as brakes as well as a lot of different um, sh like you're not going to be alone by yourself you're going to have neighbors left and right that are also going to have fences and trees and such to slow it down water so in canada we have not really much difficulty with water we have a wet season in the spring and the fall pretty much without fail uh, there are some, I remember last year, the springtime was particularly dry. And we want to think of systems that kind of store water for the drier periods, which is the summertime. And uh, ways that we can do this, we can create water butts here. This is George with his nice new water butt that he's put into his garden. Or we could design ponds that act as uh, catchment systems so that when those rains come, these ponds get filled up. And we can design what's known as ephemeral ponds where they're only filled for a short amount of time during the spring and the fall. And then they dry up in the middle of winter and they act as um, habitat for particular frogs and other species that like growing during those particular times and, and uh, reproducing them. So by having one of these two systems in place, water butts are my favorite, especially in a three by three meter space. We don't really have much space for a decent pond. So uh, having a water butt there can ensure that you have water nearly all year round as well, because we still get enough coming in from the um, summer rains as well in order to keep a uh, water butt going. So that's water. Now let's have a look at temperature. So USDA zones tell us what minimum temperatures plants can survive. And uh, when you go to a garden store or a nursery, you're going to find that every plant kind of has a zone attached to it. Zone 13 is the highest zones that we have. They, these are plants that need at least 15 degrees Celsius to survive. These are tropical plants that you won't find growing in the wild anywhere around Montreal. Zone 10 is above freezing and zone one is negative 50 degrees. This is the lowest one that we can have. This is kind of Siberian plants here. Now I have seen uh, so Montreal is zone 3-4. Uh, I have seen some maps that claim that Montreal is a zone 5, which is like uh, minus 8 to minus 12 degrees because the city really does warm things up. However, uh, really going for zone 3 or zone 4 keeps things safe. You don't want a particularly cold winter to kill off, let's say, a different, like a few species of cherry, for example, which are not that uh, cold tolerant. Um, you really want to plan for kind of the coldest times. And zones three and four are divided into 3A, 3B, 4A, 4B. 
but for now we're keeping it simple. It just kind of breaks it down into more subdivisions. Uh, I have seen folks um, in Little Italy, they grow um, fig trees that are able to, they, they die when it gets um, below freezing, but essentially what the Italian farmers do, uh, or the old generation farmers, is they bury their fig trees when winter comes. They dig a trough, they lay it down, they insulate it with a whole bunch of leaves, and they let it lay there for the winter time. And then when spring comes, they dig it back up, they uh, give it a bit of love, and then it's able to reproduce and grow figs. So I have heard of people growing plants that are a lot more um, cold, uh, cold vulnerable, but it does take a lot of work. And I've only heard of people growing bananas and such in Montreal in greenhouses that are heated throughout the winter. So we are going to be looking today at plants that are three to four followed, which means minus 40 to minus 28 degrees. Preparing the soil. Okay, so now we've had a look at our site conditions, sun, uh, water, soil, wind, temperature. Now we're moving on to what do we do with our grassy lawn to turn it into a productive food forest? And there's a few ways we can do this, and I'm going to talk, not one way I found is better than the other, it really works for what you have, and I'm going to talk about advantages and disadvantages of each of them. So first one is, how do we remove the sod? The sod is the top layer of grass. It's Sod is what you buy when you're looking to kind of put uh, new green grass on an area of bare lawn, uh, bare earth, sorry, you go and purchase some sod from a, from a landscaper. So once we remove the sod, cover crops, sheet mulching, solarizing, and wood chips. So I'm going to go through each of these techniques to prepare our soil for our food forest now. Okay, so uh, for those who don't know, this is the um, Vanille Gardens food forest. This here on, I think it's my left, I hope it's yours too. This is a uh, planting day in November 2019. So as we can see here, we have, uh, what do we have here? We have a a black walnut, a plum, and a Saskatoon berry, and we just have plain grass. And we went around and dug these diamonds just to help us place them. And here we have another diamond. We planted five diamonds in total uh, with 20 trees. And this is another diamond here in spring 2020, where we can see the daffodils are up. And again, there's just these plain diamonds with the grass there. So. We were very much, I'm not sure whether this is a three by three, but it's close enough for me to, to use this as a uh, reference point here. So the first thing we did here was we got in there and for some of them, we dug up the sod here. So here we can see our volunteers and gardeners working last year. They get in there with, um, I forget the name, there's like a lawn cutting shovel. It's like a half uh, crescent, which is uh, particularly good at cutting out lawn. And then we just, um, Dig it up using a lot of muscle. You can hire sod cutters, which are mechanical machines that kind of chop it as you walk along with it. And um, it does the job a lot faster, but uh, you need to rent those machines from somewhere around Montreal. They're about a hundred bucks a day. And what we did with this sod was two things. So remember how uh, one of the permaculture principles is produce no waste and to use uh, valuable and renewable sources. So this grass here, is filled with organic material. It can make really good soil. So one thing we did was we took the cut sod, we turned it upside down and made it in layers. And we now have a very beautiful compost pile made of this green grass that we dug up from these diamonds. The next thing that we did, and unfortunately I don't have a picture for you, but basically what you can do is dig it up, take the grass, turn it upside down and leave it in its space. So by turning the, the green grass upside down, you do two things. First of all, you block the light uh, from reaching the leaves. And the second thing is you expose the roots to the air and the sunlight, both of which the plant really don't like. And eventually the grass will rot and break down and you can use that to start feeding your soil. And there's another step, which is adding wood chips on top of that um, exposed grass, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So removing the sod, just doing it mechanically. Now here we have um, three people that are sowing. You can see all these little seeds here on the ground. They are sowing a cover crop. 
For those who don't know what a cover crop is, it's essentially a selection of plants that are grown for the purpose of feeding the soil. Farmers do this all the time. They'll harvest a particular crop, let's say in August or September, and there's not enough time to grow more vegetables, but they don't wanna leave their soil empty or bare, so they will sow a cover crop. And generally, the cover crops that we use are a mix of oats, peas, wheat, and sometimes, what's the other one? Buckwheat as well. So those four here are the plants that we have tried in these gardens. And the idea is that we let them grow. I'll show you here. <laughs> these are, this is them first germinating here. And I remember one afternoon, I counted nine squirrels in one of our diamonds. I added some extra seed here and there's one, two, three, four that I can see there, maybe five over here. And uh, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. They particularly love oat seeds. So seed more than you need. And here we can see that um, with the same diamond here. So we have our four trees, one, two, three, four. And then all of this beautiful green stuff at the front is oaks. And you can see that there's some other plants. This is an amaranth. This is some basil. This is some basil here that we planted kind of around the, uh, the cover crops. And something I like about cover crops is if you're looking at kind of adding plants as you go throughout the year, when you're ready, you can just kind of take your cutting tool, cut down an area of the oats and then plant straight into that your, your basil or your tomatoes or whatever you wish. And then you can just leave the rest of the oats growing until you're ready to use them. And so you can kind of work with it as you go. We can see it here kind of maturing a little bit more. This is the same from the other angle. Here we can, have, we can see the oats are flowering. And the nice thing about cover crops too is uh, oat flowers, for those who don't know, it's a very powerful medicinal herb, a nice calming one, very good for the nervous system. So we harvest the oat flowers and then we leave the oat stems to feed the soil. So we can actually get a yield from the cover crop, which is particularly nice. And here we can see there's more species growing in this, this, these oats here as well. Now, this right here is uh, a diamond where we didn't plant anything else. There's one purple anisysip, which we'll see in a second. And this is a nice um, meadow of buckwheat. The white flowers here are buckwheat. And buckwheat is particularly good as a cover crop for what we call compact soils. They have these, these roots that go straight down. And when we cut plant, um, those roots will kind of rot and create these little pockets that allow the, the, the soil to be broken up and the other plants to get in there with their roots and access things in there nicer, uh, easier, I should say. Here we can see that pollinators love flowers. And so if you're using a cover crop with flowers, such as buckwheat, um, you're going to have a whole host of insects and beautiful uh, butterflies that come to your gardens and enjoy it. Here I can see there's one, two ladybugs there and a nice purple butterfly here. Um, so this is one of the benefits of using cover crops. And here are some peas. For those who don't know, peas are a nitrogen fixing plant. They add fertilizer to your soil. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later on. Here we can see what the cover crop, this is the same one here, that purple plant, if I just go back, the purple anise hyssop is right here. And so here it is um, a week or two later, we cut down all of the buckwheat and you can see on the right here, I actually seeded a second crop in here. So these little plants here is young buckwheat coming up. And this is something you can do multiple times in a year to kind of give more and more organic matter to the soil. You grow a cover crop, you cut it down, and then you leave it on the soil and you sow more. And then the plant again grows up, you can cut it down and you can actually do three cover crops in one year. And this is now really nice. This has been there the entire winter. It's rotted down, it's feeding the soil. It's bringing our soil to life, essentially. Um, next we have uh, cardboard. So this is a technique called sheet mulching. And we went into our recycling bins at Vanier College. And for two of the diamonds, we uh, pulled off all of the, the sticky tape from the cardboard boxes. We laid them out. We weighed them down with these bricks and bits of wood here. And this is essentially 
and we did it right on top of the grass. So this was um, saved a lot of time. It didn't uh, mean that we had to get in there, dig and move all of that heavy sod. The cardboard basically acts as a layer that stops the sunlight from getting in and the grass underneath rots and dies. It's not the most attractive, as you can see, like there's pizza boxes and all sorts of things in here, but it works. And again, it's kind of using one of those resources that's kind of being taken away. We're keeping it in the garden. You're able to keep your cardboard boxes in a closed loop by putting them back into your gardens here. Um, some people have concerns about colored ink. Most of it, I understand, is soy-based ink. And something you can do to be doubly sure is to let your cardboard soak overnight in kind of a, we use one of the big recycling bins. And that way, a lot of the stuff can leach out. And then you take out the cardboard from there and you can put it on the gardens and you have kind of a, it's kind of a cleaning your cardboard uh, step. And then once we've put a layer, as we can see here on the right, this is a triangle that's all done. Um, we filled it with wood chips. Unfortunately, I don't have a better picture than this, but here we can see there's no more cardboard left and we put a layer uh, at like an inch or two thick of wood chips on top of this. And then uh, I can tell you this year, having a look at them, this was about um, middle of summer that we did this last year. Yeah, it's pretty sunny there. Uh, there's no grass growing here anymore which is pretty great news. And if you kind of dig under the layer and look under the, uh, the wood chips, you can still see that there's um, a layer of cardboard there. And if you look under that, you can see all of these white uh, grass and dandelion uh, weeds that are looking for the sunshine, which the cardboard isn't letting them have. The last technique, which we didn't do because I didn't have tops big enough um, and I don't really want to buy more tops if I can if I can help it, is what's known as solarizing. So here is this picture demonstrates. You basically take black plastic. It can be see-through, can it? it? But it has to be hot. Um, otherwise, you're just helping the weeds grow because you're creating a greenhouse if it's not hot enough. But generally, black plastic is what farmers use in organic agriculture. And you lay it on top of the soil. Ideally, it can be done uh, the winter before you want to plant. Let's say you want to plant in the spring next year. So this year I would cover it just before winter in black plastic. And then same thing goes with the cardboard. There's no sunlight allowed underneath there. The plants rot and die. And then from here I can seed in my uh, cover crop or I can add my wood chips to create uh, more soil activity. So solarizing is another way that we can transform grass into something else. Now, um, all of this to say, like, whether you use cover crops or cardboard or solarizing or digging it up, every single space of your food forest needs wood chips. Wood chips, if you think of a forest floor, there's very little grass on a forest floor, right? It's often the leaf material, the branches, the fallen trees. And by adding wood chips, we are recreating a forest floor, which is what we want for our food forest. Um, there's a slight drawback to wood chips, which is that they need nitrogen in order to break down. So the first year that you add wood chips, plant growth might be a little bit slower than you expect because the wood chips are still breaking down. And sometimes they can take nitrogen, especially if you dig wood chips into the soil, they'll take nitrogen from the soil that could otherwise go to the plants. But what happens after year two, year three, year four, these wood chips start breaking down and then you get some really magical things that happen. If you have sandy soil, it'll start become more loamy. If you have very heavy clay soil, it'll start getting looser and start being broken up. As basically these wood chips here are filled with all sorts of goodies that the soil uh, life uh, likes to get in there and break down and turn into tasty things that the plants then enjoy. Yes, you have a question. I was wondering whether sawdust would be better than it would be, would hmm. it be to hmm. pose? Right, um, good question. So um, sawdust, you have to, first thing you want to keep in mind is that it's probably going to be one particular kind of wood, and that might not necessarily be the best kind of wood that you have. Um, sawdust certainly degrades faster than wood chips, which isn't necessarily what you want either, because you kind of want the wood chips to be there. Like basically in our food forest, we're going to have to replace the wood chips every two, three years. If you use sawdust, it might be every year that you have to do that. 
And um, the other thing is making sure that your, your wood is like real wood, because it could be MDF or something like this from a, from a carpenter's. And what we do to get our wood chips, and uh, Olivier, who uh, was my gardener last year, can attest to this, um, we just got on, the, uh, on an online directory and we started calling local arborists. And I think it was three or four phone calls and we found a guy who was willing to come that week and drop them off. And we have been doing this, I think we've had four or five loads from the same company now. And uh, basically all that to go to say that do not waste your money on the bags of wood chips that are sold by um, gardening companies. They're often dyed as well, which is really harmful for your garden too. So we wanna keep it natural. Yes, Olivier. Just to include, um, a lot of the companies want to give it away because a lot of the time they um, they don't want to have to pay to put it in landfills and other like such places to get rid of it. So they'll actually like a lot of them will be happy to give it to you for free. Yeah, great. Thank you for adding that. And uh, the wood chips that we get from arborists are generally a mix of uh, branches, leaves, and the the granular wood there. And just one thing that you would have to keep in mind is sometimes there's also a lot of trash. So um, there can be some really weird things in the wood chips sometimes that we found. Uh, so just keep that in mind that, you know, it does come with a bit of work, but it's certainly a lot nicer than buying them in the individual plastic bags. So wood chips are kind of the, the best soil amendment you can add for your food forest. Now, this is, so we're, we're coming back here. This is uh, George Vanier's back garden. He started off with a grass lawn and so um, year zero before he's even started thinking about planting things in the fall he said all right so I'm gonna uh, rather than dig up this um, all this grass here he's just laid down a whole bunch of cardboard covered it in wood chips and it's now ready for the spring next year. Okay so that's how we prepare our soil. Now what kind of garden designs do we want to use? Um, we want to design, coming back to permaculture principles, we want to design from patterns to details. So we can have a look at nature and kind of figure out what patterns there are. Uh, and also what we want to do is value the edges and the marginals. So this means that we want to maximize the edges that are kind of going around our garden paths and um, use them because they are the places that create the most biodiversity. Now, what patterns can we copy? Four that we're going to look at is the keyhole pattern, the spiral pattern, the branching, and the wavy. So we will go into these in a little bit more detail. And I'm using a book, uh, the diagrams from a book called Gaia's Garden, which is a guide to ho home scale permaculture. I'm going to link the books later on as well, but this is um, one of the books I highly recommend for folks who are interested in starting their own little permaculture project. So keyhole design. This is um, the traditional kind of growing in paths here where you have rows upon rows and they worked out in the book that one row needs 40 square feet of path and raised beds need at least 10 square feet of path. Now, a keyhole is basically, if we have a look here, it looks exactly like a keyhole with your door. And this right here is six feet of path. So rather than having 40 feet right here, we're able to get the same amount of surface area with just six feet. The idea is that you grow in a circle and then by walking into the middle, you can reach over to these, they look like lettuce or cabbage there. You can reach over to them and access them uh, easily enough so that you don't need a second path going around it. And you're minimizing your path um, by doing this and maximizing your growing space. And if we have a look here on the right, this is a, a mandala style pattern, which is basically keyholes within keyholes. Um, so we have one keyhole garden in the center and then one, two, three, four, five growing around the outside. And that itself makes kind of one bigger keyhole garden. there. So this is something that I, uh, I really enjoy. Next, we have a spiral design. This isn't so much for food forests, um, we wouldn't design a food forest in a spiral, but it is particularly good for kitchen herbs. So the idea is, and I'll just show you the cross section here, it's actually raised. And at the top of the spiral, you have those herbs that enjoy less water. 
And at the bottom, you have those herbs that enjoy more water. And you could have a sprinkler system, which they put in here, or you can just water it from the top. And the idea is that the water, so plant 14, which is rosemary in this diagram, it's a dry, um, dry drought tolerant species. It's gonna get the least amount of water. And then slowly as we work around the spiral, we get down to number one, where fever view, fever few calendula and coriander are down here and they love it wet. And so by this is really something that you would have kind of outside your, your kitchen door as like the very first thing that you can access so you can run out from your kitchen quickly and harvest a bunch of these different herbs. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty nice, we have one of these in our, um, our gardens too. And it's not quite there yet. It's still gonna put a bit of work into it, but it does, it does look very beautiful and um, it grows a lot of stuff very well. Now, branching design. So looking at nature, like looking at patterns that we can copy, like what is, um, a pattern in nature that carries nutrients back and forth and has like a whole transport system, it's leaves. So this is the idea that we have one wide path here that is wide enough for a wheelbarrow and then branching off it, we have these little ones where you can probably get your feet just in there. Um, and by doing this, we're able to maximize the surface area uh, and uh, of our growing space while minimizing the paths here. So this is another nice design. And this is the idea of maximizing edges and using the marginal. Rather than planting things in a straight line, uh, we want to use a wavy line. And by doing this, we are creating more edges. And for those who joined later on, the idea is that like an edge is kind of, edges in ecosystems are where the most biodiversity happens. Uh, it's often like, so here we can see that plant one is gonna have a lot more sunshine and then plant two is gonna have a little bit less, but because of this kind of difference between the two, there's gonna be other insects and species that like growing in more sun or less sun that can kind of find these niches to fill. Rather here, it's just one straight line. Every plant gets the same amount of sunshine and there's very little difference between the uh, microclimates uh, in this edge here. So using wavy edges is something that you want to do as a general. So, and this is another um, example here. Traditional folk, like you'll, you'll just have a nice circular pond. However, if you're going down the permaculture route, you'll understand that all of these edges here are where the life is really happening. So creating kind of a, a splodge shaped uh, pond here, we are maximizing the edges and bringing more biodiversity into our gardens. So this is um, George's backyard here. And in spring of year one, he has mapped out his backyard paths. And he has gone essentially for one big keyhole. We're going to put a plant in the middle here and then three little keyholes coming off, kind of reaching the three other corners of his garden. And this is his uh, back door here. So just to give you an idea, these are just where he can put his plants around there and get the most out of his garden while still being able to bring a wheelbarrow uh, back and forth into the middle of his circle. And probably here, it's a bit too slim for a wheelbarrow, but he can leave it nearby so that he can you know, still save himself carrying a lot of stuff. So that's the design of the keyholes that we're going for with his backyard. Now we're gonna get onto the details. So we found our pattern, this is our pattern here. Now let's talk about what kind of Quebec plants we can use. We aim to create a plant guild. Each plant fulfills an ecological niche that benefits the ecosystem as a whole. I uh, will show you our example of a plant guild in a short while. Uh, we are planting a fruit tree guild. So the idea is that we are gonna have one or two main fruit trees in our backyard fruit forest that are going to be kind of our primary objective. And then everything we plant around it is going to help benefit this fruit tree. We are looking at plants that have a USDA zone of three to four, minus 40 to 20, minus 28 degrees Celsius. We're planning for succession. So for those who don't know what uh, this term means, um, when if you took your grass and you left it uh, unmown for, when, for let's say five years, uh, five years, you will have bushes growing. If you leave it alone for 15 years, you'll start getting trees and shrubs. And if you left it alone for 120 years, you would have um, tall 60-foot maple trees. 
And that is the kind of the plant succession that happens here in uh, Canada, Northern Canada. And by mowing the grass, we are resetting the succession. And we are not going to be mowing our food forest, shall we say. So we have to plan for succession, which means that, um, that as the years go by, year five, year 10, year 15, year 20, we're going to get changes in the garden and other species are gonna kind of come up and flourish and then other species are gonna fall back and die away. And this is something that we can put into our plan. We have a focus on perennials. For those who don't know the difference between perennials and annuals, Perennials are those plants that, plants that come back every year, and we are focusing on the ones that are medicinal or edible, so they have a use to humans. Um, we are aiming for the seven to eight layers of our food forest. So I'm not putting a pond in here, so there's not nine layers to our food forest, but we are aiming for seven to eight of them. And there's an idea here. So I am the design I'm going to talk about. I'm not putting any annuals in. So you'll notice that I don't talk about things like corn, squash, tomatoes, peppers, like these are vegetables that you can add by yourself, no problem. And we put them in our food forest as well, um, though they are plants that can only really be in there for the first like five years or so, because eventually your fruit trees are going to start shading stuff out and the soil will start to change because um, a lot of annual vegetables prefer bacterially rich soil which is what we get when we kind of turn over soil or we mow the grass, the bacteria is very strong. But when we add wood chips, fungal um, life becomes a lot stronger. And fungal life is really what um, perennials and trees enjoy the most. So by changing the nature of our soil, we're changing the nature of what we can grow and it's not a focus on annuals. I do have, however, this picture, which has been in our background is an example of an annual polyculture. Uh, this is the Three Sisters Guild that we had going last year outside the sports complex of Vanier College. And just to let you know what's going on here, we have corn growing here. Uh, we have squash growing right across here in the background. And then we have beans working their way up the corn here. And I think, yep, there's some beans over here as well, working their way up. And that's your Three Sisters, your beans, corns, and squash. The idea is that Corns provide, um, they grow upright. They don't take a lot of ground cover. They provide support for the beans. The, the squash grow across the ground. They stop other plants from growing and other weeds coming up. And then the beans are nitrogen fixers. So they feed the corn and the squash whilst growing, up the, um, whilst growing vertically up the corn. Now, the Three Sisters is a beautiful concept from First Nation peoples. However, you really need um, more like 12 to 13 sisters, it's an entire family um, for uh, something like this to work. And as you can see here, we really went for it uh, last year. We have kale down here, this is chickweed growing here. There's some basil down there, this is a mullen plant, this purple one is shiso. This is a tomato, we have a broccoli growing in the back there. And this is basically a beautiful example of an annual polyculture or an annual plant guild where every plant is taking a niche, taking a role, and we really just kind of let it do its thing. And we would come in there maybe once every two, three weeks and take a harvest and cut some things back that were getting a bit too vigorous, and that was it. Um, but that's for another time. This is, uh, this is not necessarily food forest uh, stuff. So we are now going on to the seven layers, or eight layers, I should say, of our food forest. And we are looking at the uh, canopy and sub canopy layers here. I just, I will quickly go back and just show for those folks who joined later um, the different layers I'm talking about here. So this is, um, so right here, we have layer number one, canopy. Layer number two, the under canopy. Three is shrubs and bushes. Four is herbaceous. Five is ground cover six are the roots, seven are vines, eight are water and marshlands, and nine are the mycelial or the mushroom layers. So that's kind of the, uh, the layers that I'm gonna go through now in a Quebec context. Um, here we go. So, um, canopies and subcanopies. So we're making a fruit tree guild here. So we want apples, plums, or pears, really. These are kind of the three main ones. And I put a note here that says it needs to be self-pollinating. So 
The idea is that generally uh, in Vanier's gardens, for example, we have three of each of these because this is the minimum that's needed in order for them to fertilize themselves. Uh, so like a lone apple tree will not have enough um, pollen coming from the other species to make fruit. Like it won't be fertilized and it won't grow fruit unless it's a self-pollinating species. So in your backyard food forest, you could talk to your neighbors on your left and your neighbors on your right, and then you each plant an apple tree or you get self-pollinating species. And same thing for sour cherries, because um, your normal cherries are a little bit too um, cold, um, tender, they're cold vulnerable. So um, sour cherries, are uh, another one that we could add as kind of the main centerpiece of our canopy layer here. And then another one that I've added is Saskatoon berry, which if you don't know, it's um, Amelochier in French. Saskatoon berry is a very popular uh, city tree. It grows all around and it is delicious. And um, that's canopy layer, sub canopy. Uh, we could have hawthorn trees, which are a edible and a medicinal. Linden is another very popular city tree. This makes a beautiful medicinal flower that we can use for anti-inflammatory purposes. And alder. Alder is one of our nitrogen fixing plants. And um, if we have a look, so this is um, George's backyard here. So the two overstory trees he's going to choose Gonna have a nice apple tree in the middle here. Uh, he's gonna have a Saskatoon berry in the southwest corner. And then for the understory, we're going to add a linden right by the door here because lindens, when they're in bloom, they really smell nice. So that'll make a nice aroma coming into the house. And we have a hawthorn over here to um, add to the biodiversity of our, of our food forest here. Now, shrub layer. Let's move on here. So nitrogen fixers. This is Kind of, I will, I've said this a few times now and I'll just spend a bit of time uh, going through this. The idea is that there are particular trees out there which are in a plant family known as the bee or the peen family, the Fabaceae, try this again, the Fabaceae family. And these have bacteria that live on the roots that um, absorb nitrogen from the air and then release it into the soil when they are cut. So you let a plant grow it, it creates these nodes and then you cut it back every year or two and then the, the roots die as the, the plant is cut back and it releases soil into the ground, uh, sorry, releases nitrogen into the soil and you're basically able to fertilize your plants by doing this instead of having to buy expensive um, chicken poop or using chemical fertilizers. So nitrogen fixers that are Quebec um, tolerant Siberian pea, buffalo berry, um, which is the shepherd, shepherd deer uh, genus, actually makes a berry that we can cook and eat as well. Sea buckthorn, has anybody drunk sea buckthorn juice? Like this is, um, it's, it's grown, being grown commercially now in Quebec. It's like a bright orange berry that's filled with vitamin C and extremely sour and delicious. It's also a nitrogen fixer and our alders. So within a food forest, you generally want uh, a ratio of at least like one nitrogen fixer to two fruit trees. And shrub layer isn't the only layer that you can add nitrogen fixing trees. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. The edible layer of shrubs, gooseberry. Gooseberry grows super well in Quebec and likes the shade. So we can put this underneath our trees. Currants, black currants, red currants, champagne currants. I've all seen them grow here very well. And then raspberries and all of the other blackberries. And there's even black raspberries to make things extra confusing um, that can grow well as well. So if we go to our backyard here, we have now added a shrub layer. So moving to the left of the path here, we have some raspberries. Uh, coming down here, we have our gooseberries. Over here, we have a sea buckthorn to add nitrogen both to the apple and to the Saskatoon berry. We have a black currant plant here, and we have an older tree here to add nitrogen to the apple tree. So this is our food forest starting to take shape now. Herbaceous layer. So this is moving smaller than shrubs. Generally, there's not a woody stem with these. Some of them have them, but generally not. So herbaceous layer, 
um, the mint families are where, where it's at, both in terms of creating flowers for pollinators as well as having a medicinal or culinary purpose. Um, catnip, lemon balm, lavender, or argano. There's also thyme in there, sage as well. There's also your Quebec ones, which aren't so tolerant, like rosemary is also in the mint family, but cannot survive the winter outdoors. So you would have to dig that one up and bring it in. And let's see, anything else in the mint family? No, I think that's it for now. Echinacea. So echinacea is another beautiful indigenous plant to Canada that's planted all around the city. Rebecca is kind of the cousin of echinacea. It looks very similar, just has yellow flowers instead of the purple ones. Motherwort is one of, uh, this is another mint family. Um, one of my favorites, we have it in the gardens here. It's an extremely bitter plant, but it's a very good plant for reducing levels of anxiety. I actually have it in my tea at the moment. Um, this is a very calming grounding herb that um, I think everybody should have a little in their gardens. Rhubarb, another one, comfrey and nettle. So for those who haven't heard of comfrey, comfrey is kind of your, your permaculture superstar. It is um, a medicinal herb. It's um, other names in history are bone wart or soldier's wart because it has a particular affinity for helping heal wounds, especially broken bones. It is also considered a permaculture superstar because you can use comfrey and you can use stinging nettle to fertilize your gardens. Comfrey is particularly high in potassium. And so you can essentially let it grow and it can grow generally knee height, chop it down and let the leaves rot on the floor. And then you've just created some fertilizer for your garden. Then you let it grow to knee height and then you chop it down and you can do that three, four times a year. This is an extremely vigorous plant. Um, word of warning, if you put comfrey there, uh, it's gonna stay there for the next 10 to 20 to 30 years. So keep in mind that you don't want it to spread and you want to kind of keep an eye on the, um, the seeds. I went to go visit uh, the McGill Permaculture Garden a year before last and their comfrey had gone to seed and the seed had gotten into the compost and they had comfrey plants everywhere, uh, which, you know, isn't so much of a bad thing because you get a lot of fertilizer for your garden, but they were having a bit of a headache with it. So keep in mind that comfrey is vigorous and that you want to keep an eye on it. Whenever it starts flowering, you can just cut it down and then you don't have to worry about the seeds. And there are varieties that are um, sterile. They're not, then they're not able to reproduce as well. And nettle, this is one of my favorite wild herbs out there, extremely nutritious, uh, both for us and our gardens. And comfrey and nettle can make fertilizers too. And um, one traditional way of doing this is to cut them, chop them up, throw them in a bucket and let them rot. And you basically you're making what's called a compost tea. It's gonna start smelling like a stinky pond in about seven to 10 days. And then you use that to um, fertilize your plants. You pour it around your fruit tree, pour it around your, your Saskatoon berry there, and they're getting a whole dose of nutrients and fertilizers to help them grow uh, nice and lush. So here we can see uh, I've added oregano just by the doorway here so that you know Mrs. Vanier can come and collect her, her oregano for her, her herb garden there. Um, over here, we have put some comfrey. I put nettle at the very back of the garden because keep in mind it is stinging nettle. So you don't want to have stinging nettle right by the main path here. Otherwise you're gonna end up with a lot of upset guests into your food forest when they learn what stinging nettle is for the first time. I created like a little pollinator garden over here. So we have Rebecca ears, echinacea, motherwort and another echinacea. Try and bring in those birds and bees to help us out. And then we have the rhubarb over here. And then underneath the uh, apple tree here, comfrey, rebecca, and lavender. The idea being that the more flowers you can have around your fruit trees, the more uh, beneficial insects, pollinators, um, predatory insects, such as wasps, uh, you can have growing in your garden and that are attracted to your garden and do the role of pest control for you. So this is um, a nice way to kind of get things working in guilds and get each of the plants to help each other out. 
ground cover layer. So we're talking now, these are kind of plants that grow kind of ankle height below your knee and like to spread across the ground. Um, yarrow, for those who don't know yarrow, this is an amazing, um, it's particularly good for uh, predatory insects, as well as medicinally. If you, if you like, you're like me and you're always cutting your fingers in the gardens, working, harvesting, uh, chew up some yarrow, stick it on your cut, and it'll help stop the bleeding very quickly. Uh, I've even had it stuck it up my nose with a nosebleed before and it worked quite well, where it felt a bit weird. Red clover and white clover uh, are your nitrogen fixers. These are again in the bean family, the, the BCAE family. Red clover is probably my favorite because it's medicinal as well as edible, as well as being a great all round pollinator and a nitrogen fixer. So uh, that's a great one to have around. Ground cover, chives are particularly good, especially planting them around paths. If you're trying to keep grass out, chives will kind of make bulbs that block grass from growing through them. So chives can be a nice barrier plant. Egyptian onions, this is a perennial onion. As long as you, you harvest kind of, if you've got a bunch of five or six, you can harvest one or two bulbs a year, or you just harvest the greens and chop them up like you would a spring onion. And strawberries. Strawberries are amazing at just spreading across the ground and covering a whole surface area. So this is um, a few examples of our ground cover layer. So if we come back here. I've added chives here by the path. So that we've now got a beginning of a little herb garden here from Mrs. Vanny. Uh, yarrow uh, over here, helping out the pollinators, as well as strawberries, which are gonna kind of spread into this patch here. We have uh, red clover here, as well as more yarrow and more strawberries. Red clover again over here, red clover again over here, and red clover again over here. As you can see, I like my red clover, and it's a really good one at nitrogen fixing. And um, just as long as you cut it back once a season, you're gonna be able to fertilize your more important tree uh, species growing around it. Moving on to our root layer, we have burdock. For those who don't know burdock, uh, you may have heard it called gobo. It's uh, in Asian restaurants. Uh, it's the root here that we like to eat. And um, a lot of people know the flower too. It's a beautiful purple flower that has tiny hooks, the inspiration for Velcro and will stick into your hair or get or sorry, stick under your clothes. Or if you have a dog that goes running through a field and they come back covered in these spiky balls, that's burdock. And um, this is particularly good at breaking up the soil. Um, to harvest the root, if you have clay soil, it's pretty tricky. If you have sandy soil, I pulled out roots just like this, just with a little wiggle. And, but in clay soils, that, that little wiggle turns into like 20 minutes of harvest time. Um, and the flower stem is edible too. So this is a nice one to have around. Valerian, another great um, pollinator plant, as well as a particularly powerful and somewhat smelly medicinal plant. It's the root of this that we use. Um, this is where we get Valium from originally. It comes from Valerian. And so this is a sleepy herb. Really good at helping um, restless and nervous people calm down in order to get a good night's sleep. Now, I should mention, I'm not a doctor. Uh, if you're, if you're um, going to go and use any of these, just check with your healthcare professionals or go to any herb store in Montreal and talk to the people there and just kind of cover all your bases, shall we say. Uh, okay, root layer, Jerusalem artichokes. These are also known as sunchokes or Jerusalem fartichokes. If anyone's eaten a lot of these, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, you need to cook them well. Uh, there's a lot of inulin in here, which is um, a great probiotic for gut bacteria, which basically gives your gut bacteria a party, hence the name fartichoke. Um, they're also known as sunchokes uh, because they make these beautiful sunflowers. And these are really great for Quebec um, temperatures. They, they love it here and they grow well and they actually flourish. Like um, there's, there's kind of a, a section of plants in permaculture that, um, that increase yield with harvest. And Jerusalem artichokes is one of them. The more you harvest it to a certain point, of course, the more it will produce. Uh, the idea is that um, Jerusalem artichokes, they spread by being disturbed. They're traditionally eaten by um, kind of uh, pigs and other animals with snouts that go digging and disturb the soil, and then they're spread around. And so if we go in there with our spade, we're kind of doing the same thing. So 
one year, if you get in there and you harvest a bunch of artichokes, uh, Jerusalem artichokes, they're going to be more of them next year because you've uh, spread them around and disturbed the soil. In the mycelial layer, so we're not getting too much into this today, but if you wanted to, you can inoculate some wood chips. So this is, you can go to uh, Miko Boutique on um, Saint-Denis and they'll tell you about how to inoculate wood chips. And um, essentially you take a bunch of wood chips, you sterilize them by putting them in your oven or steaming them. And then you mix in the spores or the mycelium or the particular mushroom that you want to try and grow. And then you can mix that into your nice big bed of wood chips that you have in your backyard. And you can start introducing mycelial connections as well as growing some mushrooms to eat. And the last thing you can add are mushroom locks. So this is where you take cut wood, drill holes and add mycelium into it um, in order to uh, start growing mushrooms out. So let's have a look what this looks like here. So um, our burdock, let's see. So we have, yes, we have a shiitake log right here, growing in the middle space there. We have mushroom uh, oyster inoculated wood chips growing right here. This is the burdock over here next to the nettle. And this is a valerian growing right here. And then we put sunchokes up here uh, because they do, like some people consider um, Jerusalem artichokes invasive. So having them in the corner of your garden means they're not going to spread too far around. And let's see here, the vine layer, the last layer. So some vines that we can have in um, Montreal that are perennials. We have grapes, hops, and arctic kiwi. There's so many annuals as well, like passion flower or cucumbers or beans or peas, but we're focusing on our perennial species here. Grapes, you can, we get wild grapes growing very well here, but they have quite a big seed. You can buy your commercial grapes that have a much bigger um, flesh, uh, much bigger fruit and smaller seeds, so they're easier to eat. Hops, uh, you could try brewing your own beer. You can also eat the tips and they are also a very good um, sleepy uh, tea, extremely bitter, but some people like that. I'm quite a fan myself. And then we are able to grow one kind of kiwi fruit in uh, Quebec, which is the Arctic, Arctic kiwi. It grows a little kiwi the size of a grape. It's super cute. When you bite into it, it looks like a tiny kiwi. And this grows um, quite well here as well. And it's quite delicious and a fun one to have growing around for sure. So here I said that, uh, you know, George, he's, he's a bit old school. He likes his grapes and his hops, but his Arctic kiwi is a bit too strange for him. So we're going to grow the grapes uh, on the north side wall here. So it's going to get a bit of the sun there. And then we're going to have the hops growing along one of the neighbor's fences. Hopefully the neighbor is not going to be too annoyed. Now, I haven't really spoken much in this diagram about height, but this is certainly something that we want to keep in mind that if we grow very tall plants at the front south edge of our garden here, those in the north edge are going to get blocked out. So this is something that you want to keep in mind. And I think I've done it just by um, kind of intrinsically here. There's none of these are particularly aside from our trees and none of these are going to grow particularly tall and block out the sunlight. So our trees are going to cast a bit of shade. Let's say this red clover here is going to get a bit of shade from the apple tree let's say in the middle part of the day, but then in the east and the west, it's still got a nice clear avenue. Same for the linden here. The Saskatoon berry's got no problem. The hawthorn's got no problem either. It's gonna get blocked by the, uh, the, the um, apple tree a little bit in the southwest, but otherwise everything's gonna get a lot of sunshine. Okay, so this is our final, final design here for the backyard food forest. Um, I'm not sure how many species I put in here in the end, I didn't have a final list. Let's see. Do I count them now? No, it's over 20 species, I think. Uh, I can easily, easily tell you that uh, without spending too much time uh, counting. So the future of the food forest, let's think of plant succession, like what's gonna happen here? As the years go by, we can expect the diversity of your space to decrease, but the yields of fruiting trees to increase. So the biodiversity, as these uh, trees get bigger, there's gonna be more shade under there, which means less plants are gonna be able to grow. So, but um, bigger trees means bigger yields of fruit and berries and um, linden flowers and hawthorn berries and such. A lot depends on how you prune your trees. Like linden trees, for example, can grow. 
this tree here, if you get one particular species, it can grow 60 feet high and in 50 years time and just encompass your entire garden in shade. Or you could prune it every year, climb up on a ladder and cut it to a height of 10 feet or 12 feet. And then it's gonna stay in your garden. It's gonna keep the, the shade to a, to a limited uh, portion, probably this section here. And um, you still have space in the rest of your garden. Same thing goes for the uh, apple trees as well. I've seen beautiful apple trees that are 40 feet tall. It's um, great to watch, not, not too easy to harvest. <laughs> So uh, something to keep in mind that you kind of want to keep these things at a certain height as you allow them to grow. And here's kind of my estimation of where our backyard food forest will be in five to 10 years. So the raspberries have really spread up here. The linden tree has come over here. The chives are hanging on. The yarrow's hanging on. The rhubarb loves the shade. So it's hanging on over there. The, the um, Jerusalem artichokes have spread. The whole thorns pushed out. The hops have taken over the entire fence. We've lost a lot of the species that were under the apple tree because of the extra shade, but the apple tree is now bigger. And ideally you let it grow to a point where you can actually still walk in this path. So we're, truning, we're pruning branches that are kind of um, six feet or lower so that it kind of grows as an overhang that you're still able to walk under. Our buckthorn tree here is doing well. The nettles kind of bushed out the alder and the Saskatoon berry. Comfrey, you can't get rid of it for love nor money. So it's always gonna hang around there. And our strawberries are still hanging on, kind of taking the low spots here. And our mushrooms have long since been decomposed back into the wood chips. So this is kind of my estimation of where it goes in five to 10 years. And beyond that, it's totally up to what uh, Mr. and Mrs. Vanier decide to do with this garden. Like, it could be, you know, after 20, 30 years, the apple tree may die and they may want to replace it. They may want to just let the linden grow or the older grow and replace the space that the apple tree took beforehand. It's really up to the owners as to the future of this food forest after kind of year 10, shall we say. Now, we are moving on to uh, Vanier's food forest. So uh, I have some good news. As of yesterday, we got confirmation of a grant with Tree Canada to add uh, a few thousand dollars of extra um, uh, fruit and uh, berries to our food forest. It's already there. We currently have 20 fruit trees, plums, pears, apples, um, as well as Saskatoon berries and pecans, pecans and hazelnuts. And we are going to add, this is kind of the plan that I submitted um, with the, uh, the food forest submission here, the, the Tree Canada grant. Uh, we're gonna add a whole bunch of currants, elders, mixed berries, blackberries and raspberries, as well as a lot of different nitrogen fixers. And we can see here that I've added a few of the keyhole gardens going on there. And then this section in the front here, well, I'll show you what that's gonna become in a short while. Last uh, fall, we had a, um, mushroom log workshop. So we actually inoculated logs with oyster, reishi, lion's mane, and shiitake. And so you can see that these little white splotches here on the, the bark are where we drilled holes, hammered in the mycelium, and let them grow. And uh, they're doing quite well this year. I discovered that um, particular rodents like eating the bark of uh, maple trees. So some of these have been stripped of their bark, but hopefully, fingers crossed, the mycelium will be uh, okay. Um, and we're gonna have to water those in the winter. We are having a solar panel added to our pergola. That's gonna be added um, hopefully May 3rd, that's the plan. Um, and with this, we are going to use it to power our water system. So we have rainwater collection that is currently not being used too much because you can't really get enough pressure for a hose pipe, but hopefully with this and a water pump in there, we'll be able to do that. This right here is the food forest as of, what is this, fall last year. And so this wide section here is going to become a uh, perennial meadow. So that's this sections here in the front. We've got one here and one there. And these sections are gonna be seeded by a class next week in biology. I'm making them do the work. They are designing the seed mix to put in here. And they've got a mix of like clover and alfalfa and oats and other such things that they're gonna add here. And then you can see here that 
this is going to be left to kind of grow by itself and the main footpath is going to walk through the middle there to the impure. Um, and the other things that are going on, oh yes, we have um, confirmation of planning. We're in the planning phase of creating a First Nation garden at Veni as well. We received funding for that this year. We are going to be working with two previous um, environmental wildlife students, one from Ganawagi, one from Ganasatagi, and they're going to be helping us design um, a First Nation garden to be put somewhere on campus. My hope is that this is the the path that goes through um, goes through the food forest right here. It goes all the way to the end building. My plan is that it's going to go right here in front of the food forest. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what they suggest. We're going to walk around campus. Okay. So that's what's going on with NEA this year. Um, we are open to volunteers, um, but very limited. Um, at the moment, folks are able to come by themselves, which isn't the best. Like you can come and do a little bit of um, litter picking and cleaning the trash that's uh, on campus. And we're working uh, because of COVID restrictions to kind of create more systems where folks are able to come by themselves and work on the gardens with whatever needs to be done. Um, and they still have that access, um, even though they're by themselves, you know, because part of it's, you know, being outside and part of it's being with people and we can't really be with too many people right now. So, but you can still come outside. So we're working on that to kind of figure out systems where folks can be autonomous volunteers. Now, further resources, if you're interested in learning more about a backyard food forest. So volunteering with us. Uh, Edible Forest Gardens by Dave Jackie. Uh, this is, um, there's a two-part book. Uh, it's at the Veni College Library at the moment, though I have the copy, so you're going to have to wait a while. Uh, uh, this, the first volume is all about design. The second is all about uh, practice. And this is a really good uh, in-depth um, theoretical kind of underpinning of forest gardens. Gaia's Garden is a, um, is a really, I got it right here. This is a much um, more friendly book. It's got a lot of uh, beautiful pictures in there and it's for the home scale permaculturist. This is really the kind of the backyard food forest that we're talking about here. And it's a great introduction to permaculture if you're kind of new to it to begin with. Uh, there are what are called PDCs or permaculture design courses. Um, there are schools in Montreal that offer it in English and French and most of them are online now, so you can probably take them from all the way around the world if you wanted to. And this is, um, it's called a 10 day course. So it's basically, you take this and the idea is in like 10 days, more or less, um, you kind of have a fundamental underpinning of what it means to design using permaculture. And there's like a design project is a whole part of this. I did this course uh, four years ago, I think. And um, it's on my to-do list to start teaching this from uh, Vanier College some point in the next five years, I'd say. Now, the slides that I'm talking about will be available with the video on our uh, Vanier TV sustainability channel, probably by the end of this week or next. Uh, and if you're subscribed to our newsletter, uh, you'll be sent the links at the beginning of May when that goes out. So now, um, are there any final questions for me? Time is up. Oh yeah, right on time. Super. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, no such thing as a stupid question. The only stupid question is the one you don't ask. So um, go right ahead if anybody has any for me. Well, okay, no questions. I think that means I did my job well. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it earlier. I had another meeting. No worries. The whole thing will be there for you to catch up on. Uh, I appreciate the thanks. Thank you. That's yeah, really, really interesting. Super. Well, if uh, there are no final questions or comments, I will bid you all a uh, good afternoon in this uh, snowy Montreal day and um, hope to see you in the garden sometime soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care, everybody. All right, have a good day. See you.